So I'm going to be showing you a couple pictures. There's only 30 of them. Just kidding. There's three. And when you look at these pictures, they're going to show up on the screen. I want you to call out what role does this person have in their family? What do you think? Like just looking at the picture, what role do they have in their family? What, what role does this guy have in this family? What do you think? Grandpa. I hear grandpa. I hear louder. There's so many of you. Father of the house, grandpa. Okay, okay. Next picture. What about this lady? Mom. Mom, okay. What was that one? Monarch. Monarch, okay. <laughs> All right, go Randy. <laughs> All right, and next picture, let's look, take a look at this young man. What do you think? Son. Son, son, okay. So here is what is interesting about these pictures, and this is why I did this. Um, I have noticed that we, as humans, we have a tendency to kind of want to put a single role on a person. And it kind of depends on their age. It depends on where they are in life. But depending, especially depending on age, like we look at that older man and we see father. We see probably grandfather. And that younger man, we see, no, he's probably a son. He's young. He's there. But what we don't see is that we, as every single person in here, we all carry multiple roles. We all carry multiple titles in our family. That first man we saw, he was a father. Maybe he was a grandfather, but he's also, at one point, he was a son. He's a son. He's a brother. He's an uncle. He's a nephew. We care, and it's the same for all of you. You all are carrying more than one role. And maybe you, you identify as one more than the other right now. Like right now, I'm feeling like a father, okay? <laughs> I feel that every day I, I wake up. You heard that last message. Um, but my point is, you are not bound by a single role in the family. And it's the same for the church. In the church, you are not bound to a single role as a son and daughter in the church, or as maybe a mother or a father, or even as a brother and sister. But depending on the circumstances, depending on who you are with, who you are relating to, you take on different roles. To some people, you are like a son, you are like a daughter. To others, you're like a mother or a father. And so even to everyone, we are all brothers and sisters. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that is the that is the crux of this message. So I'm basically done. So, <laughs> so see it, see you later. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go through. We're gonna explore these different roles, and the one that I want to go to first is son and daughter. And son and daughter is kind of an interesting one because we're all sons and daughters of God, right? But we're also sons and daughters to to each other, to certain people in the church. So turn in your Bibles to Galatians three. Verse 26, Galatians 3, verse 26. <clears throat> Where'd it go? There it is. Verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It is your faith in Jesus that brings you into the family of God. You know, we kind of throw around the term child of God. Oh, you're a beloved child of God to everyone. And sometimes, it's, you know, it's only true if you're a Christian. <laughs> you know, you only are adopted into God's family truly if you are a Christian. It was, it was because of your belief in Christ that brought you into the family of God. 27, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. So we're taking him as a covering, like putting on new clothes so that there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so we see this, that through Christ's sacrifice, through what he did on the, sacri on the cross, every single one of us has been adopted into the family of God. And that's good news, right? And then furthermore, because of that sacrifice, we put on Christ. We put on his semblance so that all negative titles, anything that held us back before, the title of sinner, the title of slave, all negative aspects of being a man or being a woman, and yes, we all have them, we're not identified by those anymore, okay? Because in God's eyes, to God and to the church and to the world around us, the title that we take on above all others is child of God. 
child of God so that we can stand before God on judgment day. He looks at us now and he doesn't see us. He sees Jesus. That doesn't mean that my identity has been taken away. I'm still Christian to can, right? But before the father, we're, we're like his son. It says we're co-heirs with Christ. That's a beautiful thing. That's why it says we take on, we clothe ourselves like Christ. Before God, we are like him. So we confidently stand before God and man bearing that title, child of God. And that title, child of God, it comes with privileges. It comes with privileges. You have been given, well, let's, let's go to the verse. Romans 8, Romans 8, verse 15. So you have not received when you were saved. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Again, moving away from this slave mentality. You're no longer slaves. You're a child of God. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Amen. Now we call him Abba, Father, that endearing form of my dad, my daddy. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. Wow. Thank you, Lord. In fact, together with Christ, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Can we say wow? wow. Amen. So the privileges that you are given when you become a child of God are these, among many others. But this is kind of a Trinitarian focus. Number one, you are given unrestricted access to the Father. Unrestricted access to the Father through prayer. You can call on him at any time, Abba, Father. And I love that because, number one, you don't need a priest. You don't need a prophet. You don't need anyone to mediate on your behalf to come into it. You don't need me as a pastor. You don't need Pastor Gary or Shelley as pastors to mediate on your behalf. We'd love to intercede in prayer for you. But you can talk to God on your own. You have unrestricted access to the Father. And I love how it's, it's so personal with that Abba Father. It's not just, you know, we come before God and we, you know, we put on our sackcloth and ashes and then we, we just get on our knees and we do like a formula, like a super religious thing, like, oh, Heavenly Father, great are you, Lord. Majestic is your name in all the earth. That's good and that's, that's great to honor him that way but he's our father. <laughs> I don't talk to my dad that way. <laughs> oh, gracious David. <laughs> Please may your score not fall upon me today. You know, we don't talk to our parents like that. So we come to God in this familiarity, and that comes with being a child of God. Another privilege that we have is that we are given the Holy Spirit. As a seal of our faith, this Holy Spirit is the proof that we are saved, and it is the proof of the hope of salvation that we have, the hope that we will spend eternity with Jesus. And he guides us through our life, and he empowers us every single day. That's because you're a child of God. People who are not in God's family don't have the Holy Spirit. What a blessing we have. And then finally, we are given equal inheritance with Jesus, wow. with Christ. The person through whom the universe was spoken into existence. Wow. We have been given equal inheritance. So what's the equal inheritance? What do we inherit? Everything. Yeah. The universe, all of creation, is given to us through Christ. Through his sacrifice, we become children of God. We, we, we bask in that inheritance because he's a good, good father and he loves us and he wants to give good gifts to his kids. He wants to give all the good stuff to us. He loves us. Once you gain that title, child of God, you're now a member of the family. You're a member of the family. And sometimes I think we get so focused. This is the title that I think we get the most. And that's why we're starting out here from this point. I get I'm a child of God. I get I'm a son of God. But don't forget that if you're a son, that means you're a part of a broader family. If you're a daughter, you're a part of a broader family. It's not just a one-way relationship between me and my dad, between me and my mom, between me and God. I've got brothers and sisters. I've got sons and daughters. You're not bound to one role. You're not bound to one title. 
So we are children of God. We are all sons and daughters of God, but we are also sons and daughters to each other. You're like, what? Excuse me, that doesn't make any sense. It does. You are all sons and daughters to each other. There are certain people in the church whom you relate to as sons and daughters. They are our spiritual mothers and our spiritual fathers. These are the people who went before us in the faith, who paved the way for us while we were still young and we were still inexperienced in our own faith. Important people through whom we would not be here today without them. And because of their age and their authority, their age or their authority, talk about age being like how old they are, but authority, the position of leadership they have in the church, the position of leadership that we have in the church, we as their sons and daughters show them honor and respect diligently, diligently. Talking about age, 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, says, never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would your own father. Verse two, treat older women as you would your own mother. God is calling us as members of the family of God to treat those older than us with just a reverence and a respect and to listen to them and care for them and honor them. And if we are not following through on that, we are not doing our jobs. Because if we all have, we all have grandparents in our own families and if we're not honoring them, we're not taking care of them when they're not able to take care of them ourselves, that is horrendous to the Lord. So we need to take care of them as a church. As a church, we take care of them and love them and honor them and respect them. And then in terms of authority, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. This one talking more about like spiritual leadership must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, God will lift you up in honor. And so we see this this respect and this honor. It's given to those who are of older age, who are older than us, but it's also given to those of us who are in spiritual authority, that we who are younger submit to our spiritual authorities. I'm younger than Pastor Garen, and he is my lead pastor, so I submit to him. And I'm very blessed to do that because he's a very good leader, and he leads our congregation very, very well. The same thing with Pastor Shelley. And there's this, there's this sense in the Bible that we, that we who are younger we do submit to those who are older and those who are in leadership. I don't think that's changed since the Old Testament versus the New Testament. The same way that a son submits to his father in real life. Like, if Claire or Danny are talking back to me, you know, a couple years time. <laughs> Claire's already getting there. <laughs> um, they, they, like, we don't, have a, we don't have an equality in our relationship. Before God, we are all equal, okay? But there's a, there's a hierarchy, okay, between those who are younger and those who are older and those who are in leadership and those who are not. That's what the Bible teaches. And we need to honor them and respect them because God has given to them uh, to us as gifts. As gifts. As their sons and daughters, we clothe ourselves in humility. Remember, we clothe ourselves with Christ. Now we are clothing ourselves with humility, listening to their instruction, learning from their experience, and leaving behind all pride, believing that I've got it all figured out. Because let me tell you something, we do not have it all figured out. And there's something about life experience and leadership experience that is intended to help us who are younger, right? Those who aren't in leadership. We don't have it all figured out, and that's why we have mothers and fathers in the church to help us and guide us. So I challenge you, 
do not disregard the direction of those who have gone before you in the faith, of your spiritual mothers and fathers, but listen to them, hear them out, and seek them out. Seek them out. You want to talk about regrets. Man, we, every single person, every single time that one of the, these old saints passes away and their knowledge of the faith goes to be with Jesus with them, that's a tragedy. That is a tragedy. So we who are younger, we who are sons and daughters, need to seek them out because we are their spiritual legacy. Guys, I was humbled in these past couple of weeks because my grandfather, he's a wonderful man. He's still alive, <laughs> okay? Oh, he's a wonderful man. And he's always sending me the, um, um, his old sermons. He's, he's sending me like guides and, and advice on how to be a minister, which I value so much. And at the end of his, at the end of his most recent email, he ended with this. He said, Christian, do not hesitate to reach out to me for any reason, any question about the ministry or life while you still can. And that hit me. Because he's 90, old, more than 90 years old now. So I don't have much time left with him. And so the spiritual legacy that he has will be gone and I won't see him again until I'm in heaven. And so me, it's my responsibility as his spiritual son to seek him out and grab it just as much as it is his responsibility to seek me out and give it out to him. You get what I'm saying? We as the church need to care for our elders in age and in authority and diligently seek out their instruction and their wisdom not forget about them and not neglect them. We need to take care of them as our family members. Amen? Amen. 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 That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to flip it around. We're going, we're going hard here. Not only are you all spiritual sons and daughters, you are also mothers and fathers in your own right. Everyone in this room, I think there was a baby in here, so maybe not, but maybe they're gone now, so it's fine. You're all in your own way mothers and fathers here. There are people here who are your spiritual successors, and to them, you are their mothers and fathers. I know you're not too young. You're not too young. You have something to offer them. I think of those kids who are over in the, in the kids' wing or the youth that I meet with every single, every single week. They are our legacy. They are your spiritual legacy. Don't neglect them. Invest in them the way you wish somebody invested in you in the faith. We all feel like, no one invested in me in the faith, so I'm not going to invest in the next generation. Okay, stop it. Right. First off, if you felt wrong by the previous generation, the, the, the responsibility, or your responsibility is not to be angry at the previous generation. Your responsibility is to fix the pattern. That's forgiveness. And so invest in our children. Invest in our youth. It's not just on me. It's not just on Tori and Joseph to invest in our kids. Train them up in the way they should go. And they will not soon depart from it, even when they're old. Do you know the reason we have the book of Deuteronomy? Do you know what Deuteronomy means? It means second law. And it was the law given a second time to the Israelites, there's some new stuff in there too, but essentially it's the law given a second time to the Israelites after they've wandered in the desert for 40 years. So they got the law during their wanderings, and then they were just like kicking up dirt for 40 years, walking around, sitting in tents, until that previous generation died, and they were allowed to go into the promised land. But guess what happened as they were wandering? They didn't pass on the law to the kids. They didn't teach the instructions of the Lord to their children, so Moses had to get up on the mountain again and give it to them again. Second law. What did they have to do? They were just kicking around dust in the wilderness. 
But may it not be said of us as the church, right? It is not just the parents' responsibility. It is your responsibility as their biological parents to raise up your child in the way they should go. Raise up your child in Christ. But it is all of your responsibility as well. It is my responsibility too. No one is exempt. I, you know, I may get in trouble for this, but there's this idea going around this church right now that certain people are like, more called to youth ministry or more called to kids ministry. And maybe someone has a gifting or leaning that way. But I just think we're using it as an excuse. I think it's like, you know, I'm just not really called to go out of my comfort zone. I don't think God wants that for me. Wow. Yikes, guys, that's not true. That's nowhere in the Bible at all. <laughs> like, like show, can you show me chapter and verse where that mentality is in the Bible? The kids are our responsibility. The youth are our responsibility. We need to take it. Take it. Invest in them. Be their mothers and fathers, even if they're not yours. Don't you want to see this generation of world changers that we're going to make and the fact that they're all going to come out of NFC. And I just had this just picture of them just being like interviewed on CNN one after another, maybe Fox News, I don't know what you're into. And then they say, what, was the, what had the biggest impact on you? Like, what had the biggest impact on your faith, on your life? I came from NFC. I came from Northwest Family Church. And I didn't just have one kids leader. I didn't just have one youth leader. I had 150 people who were speaking life into me and training me up in the way I should go. There was no way I could leave that path. There was no way I could depart from it because I was held accountable and I was loved so dearly by everyone. No one is exempt. Can you say that? No one is exempt. No one is exempt. So volunteer in kids' ministry, in nursery, in youth. We should all be taking turns. Because, guys, man, I'm going long today, but it's okay. Um, there's, there's, this, there's this mentality that's going on in our youth right now, and you all know it. It's this idea that they're, because they, you know, they've, we're taking care of them in kids' ministry, we're taking care of them in youth ministry, we're kind of, they're in their own spot. So the, the transition point between kids and youth back to big church is scary for them because they haven't experienced it and because it's unfamiliar. So make it familiar for them. Give them a face that they latch on to. Show yourselves to them because it is weird to go from a room that's full of like two or three adults that you know to a room full of a hundred adults that you know. That's weird. Make it familiar to them. Take away that tension. So they're excited to go to big church. Get what I'm saying? All right, well, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> not only are you mothers and fathers, not only are you sons and daughters, but you are also brothers and sisters. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. God is calling us all to be united as brothers and sisters. One mind. I think of it as one flesh. You know what I mean? It's like David and Jonathan. It says their hearts were knitted together as one. They were of one mind, one spirit, one heart. That's supposed to be us as brothers and sisters. My, my, uh, my wife's family is like this. They're just so much tighter than even my family was. Like my, my brothers and sisters, I love them, but I'm not as tight with them as, as Sarah is with her siblings. I think it's because she's Ukrainian. But um, they're just so tight. They're of one mind, one spirit. They go after the same goals. They're always supporting each other. And as a church, we're called to the same thing. We chase after the same goals. We're sharing Jesus and growing together. That's why we do events like the Fall Festival and we all participate in events like that. 
That's why we're committed to our kids and growing them up. And discipleship, mother and father can also be for like an, an older man and a younger man, older woman and a younger woman. We love and take care of each other. Knocking on doors, making phone calls, texting, seeing each other in the hospital. We take care of each other. And we don't tolerate division. We learn to recognize when the enemy is trying to divide us. And guys, as a church, the enemy has been trying to divide us. Not only in this past season, but it feels so tangible in this past season. So many offenses that have come up from our people against us or against each other. And I gotta tell you something. The enemy loves to create false offenses. The enemy loves to make us feel like we're not, I'm not being taken care of. They didn't call me enough. No one came to speak to me. Don't allow yourself to fall into that kind of mentality because it's a lie from the enemy. And you know, if your sister hasn't called you in a while, you don't just sulk about your room saying, she hasn't called me in a while, she must hate me. You give her a call. You give her a call. Don't let the enemy tell you that the pastoral team does not care about you. I know firsthand that we do. We love you guys with a deep love. And I've seen Pastor Garen and Shelley's love for you. Don't allow the enemy to tell you that we don't care about you. They should have called you. They should have texted you. They should have visited you. Guys, we're doing the best we can. We love you, and we're trying to honor you. Give us a call anytime. We'll connect with you, okay? I'm totally off my notes, but it's fine. <laughs> Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't assume you're right all the time. Be open to people and allow them to change your heart. Allow them to change your mind. Don't enter that heart of stone that says, I'm right all the time. But be tender-hearted and be willing to take advice. Be humble. And finally, Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us think of ways... Think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord is drawing near. Guys, I have never felt that the day of the Lord is more near. This was written 2,000 years ago and they thought the day of the Lord was near. Guys, it is upon us. And so we need to be motivating each other and loving each other and encouraging each other as brothers and sisters in the faith. The world we're living in is the absolute worst. I am appalled at what I see on the news every week. It's horrendous. But we as the church need to be a bastion a bastion where we can come in and love each other and care for each other like a brother cares for his sister. We lay down our lives for each other. Find ways to stay connected. Come to church. Guys, it's not enough to come every other week or once a month. We need to be coming every single week. And if you're not able to because of a physical thing, that's fine. That's why we do church online. It's for you. But don't just watch. Engage in the comments. Come to our online connect groups. Find some way to stay connected because once you are disconnected, that is when the devil will make you discouraged. And he will try to rile up all of those false offenses. That's why I worry so much for our online population. Oh man, it got quiet in here. We want to encourage you, but you need to stay connected too. Join my connect group. We have a ball every single week, Wednesday nights, online. This is what it means to be the church. We are here for each other as the family of God. 
We are the church built on Jesus, a house for his presence, and even death cannot stop us. All of the fake offenses, all of the, all of the things the enemy piles up against us, they cannot stand between us loving each other and caring for each other and supporting each other and building each other up in the faith and honoring and respecting those who have gone before us. We need to be doing these things, seeking after them with a fervent passion, saying, I am going to treat this church as my family family first. We're blood. We're blood. Because the blood of Christ covers us. And we are all covered with the likeness of Christ. So let's love each other. Let's encourage each other and motivate each other to good works. Why don't you all stand up? Let's pray. How many of you, as you're as you were listening to this message, you're thinking, I need to be a better, you can all, heads bowed, eyes closed. I need to be a better brother and sister. I need to be a better mother or father. I need to be a better son or daughter. Would you just raise your hand? Yeah, that's a lot of you. Good job, me too. I'm right there, I'm right there with you. Right there with you. Jesus, we come before you humbly we clothe ourselves in humility and say, we have not always gotten it right. We haven't gotten the family of God right, but we're wanting to. We're wanting to move forward to treat our, our mothers and fathers with respect and honor, to treat our sons and daughters with an investment mentality, raising them up in the faith, and to treat our brothers and sisters with love and care. And so, Jesus, help us, empower us through your Holy Spirit to do that, to meet these goals, to love one another deeply so that when other people look at our church, look at NFC, Northwest Family Church, they see not a church divided, but a church united against the forces of the enemy, and not even death can stop us. In Jesus' name, we want to be that church. So we submit to your leading. Say, Lord, change our hearts, soften our hearts. Let us be tenderhearted, Lord. Bless this church as we do great things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And one last invitation. Maybe there are some of you who who aren't a member of the family of Christ yet, but you want to be. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Is there anyone who wants to be a part of the family of God today? Would you raise your hand? If you're in in the room or online. All right, let's pray. So we're all gonna pray together, but if this is your first time, just pay close attention to the words and pray them from your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I turn from my sins. And I turn to you and ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Cover my sins with your blood. And Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, it's never felt more relevant. You are a member of the family of God. You have, yes, amen. You are surrounded by a huge cloud of witnesses. You are surrounded by this church and full of people who love you and want to support you and honor you and respect you. And that's a good thing. I love you guys. I'll see you later. Great word, Pastor Christian. I love just the idea, this concept that your role in the family of God takes on many different forms depending on who you're with. I love that. Be a mother, be a father, be a son, be a brother, be a sister. So good. It's just what we needed. And I hope you see the church in a new way. I do. This was was a great, great word. Hey, I've got a special surprise for you next Sunday. Next Sunday... (laughs) Supply chain willing, (laughs) we will have new cushy seats in the worship center. Yeah.
<laughs> they are supposed to be here on Thursday, and so uh, if you're just hanging out on Thursday and want to come help us, uh, let, let, let me know. I'm sure there'll be some, some unpacking and setup to do on that. Speaking of setup, tonight is Together Nights, and right here in the room, we want to set up the, uh, the, uh, for the, the women's groups who'll meet here. Jerry, can I just ask you just to oversee that, just make sure it happens right, because I think you know what's going on with that. Uh, so we don't have to tear down all the chairs, but just some. If you're able to help us to set up, would you stay just for a few minutes, five or so minutes afterwards? I would appreciate it so much. As you're heading out, make sure you pick up some of our invite cards. Take as many as you need. Take as Take it up for the whole class, the whole team, the whole neighborhood. Let's get them out. Let's invite everybody. We'll see you next week here in person and online. God bless you.